As you move to a safe distance, he draws his fist back and resumes his assault. The blows rain down with increased fervor, but the machine perseveres in spite of his efforts. Spreading his arms wide, Aethys draws power from the luminous Audra. He returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys' body. Built to withstand the passage of thousands of years, cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted. The machine spins erratically, but withstands the relentless barrage. Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense heat. Aethys drives his right fist into the machine's center. You see Aethys's arm shatter upward from his hand through his elbow. A flash of light and heat bursts from the core, accompanied by a cacophony of destruction. The moment passes as Aethys's shout echoes throughout the valley. Your eyes begin to rec... As Aethys's voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mort. On your recommendation, Aethys disperses his essence and that of the thousands of souls within him to centers of knowledge and learning around the world. Animancers, engineers, wizards, and scholars of all stripes make astounding breakthroughs in understanding and harnessing the phenomena that govern Aora. While some of these developments prove beneficial to Kith, others are decidedly less so. But such is the price of innovation. What remains to be seen is how, indeed whether, they will restore the cycle Aethys has broken. In reaching Ukaizo and facing Aethys, you have accomplished the impossible. And you have done it without the assistance of the great powers of Deadfire. Your feats capture the awe and imagination of a world that needs heroes more than ever. Some say you're in with each day, your legend grows. As does the chaos in Deadfire. Ukaizo remains unclean, and the Afekia Channel becomes the site of a near constant battle as the Juana and the Rawatayans vie for control of the unprotected island. The Rawatayans rely on their cannons, and the Juana call forth massive waves and beasts of the deep to sink their foes. And while they chip away at one another, emboldened by their rival's distraction, the Valiant Chain the Company seizes territory and mines Luminous Audra at a startling pace. Juana villages are left at the mercy. To support their operations, the Valian Trading Company begins shipping ever greater quantities of supplies and Luminous Audra to and from the archipelago. This attracts the attention of the Principi who target these ships within the mysterious deaths of Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa provoke hostilities between the Valian settlers and the Huawan residents. What starts with angry words escalates. By the time anyone bothers to question the strange coincidences surrounding their deaths, including reports of a cloaked Omawi woman seen in both the port and the village, both sides have... As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. With the major powers at one another's throats, Nekataka becomes a maelstrom of chaos. Spies and smugglers follow the flow of refugees into the city, where violence is commonplace. Ukaizo remains. The Kahanga leadership takes responsibility for the welfare of the Raparu, and the gullet starts to improve. What was once a den of crime, poverty, and illness, Slowly be with Skiarelephus's essence still empowering the Water Shapers Guild. The practice of water shaping grows and flourishes in Nekitaka, and its practitioners rise in prestige. 
They install conveyors in the falls that run through the city and craft sculptures for every street and plaza. Thus, the Water Shapers Guild, your brief encounter with Lefarn, proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawnstars. Plagued with nightmares and haunted by the deaths at Hesongo, Lefarn begins questioning his faith in Aethys. At first, his fellow Dawnstars chide him. But that changes as word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads. After all, what business have they with the faith of the children of the Dawnstar's fates? But their commitment to the people of Deadfire does not. They continue feeding, healing, and helping the neediest, just as they have for decades. Ruanu, the chieftain of the Juana at Tikawara, dies mysteriously. The tribe finds his body washed up on the same beach where Anaharu challenged him to the trial of waves. Some blame Anaharu's vengeful spirit. Others see it as Ngati's final judgment. And a few speak of a strange man seen lingering in the village. Anaharu, Anaharu, Anaharu. Ruano. <laughs> the leaderless tribe eventually scatters. Some head to Megataka, while others seek out the Lahaki. The dragon, Nerascirlas, no longer passes between Aeora and the White Void, and the dead flow slowly breaks apart, exposing the temple long frozen within. Under Halfjorn's guidance, the Harbingers of Dusk resettle within Remergon's temple, vowing to forever protect it from the defiling touch of outsiders. Over time, the group becomes increasingly investing the beast of winter. You earned the death god's mercy rather than his enmity. The deity remains characteristically unforthcoming about his decision. And you're left to wonder whether in doing battle with him in the white void, you somehow furthered his op Once repaired, the Adra at the primal island of Kazuwari again pulses with the flow of soul essence between the here and the beyond. The feral life on the island flourishes. The jungles and veld growing ever wilder and resistant to settlement and Oy, exploration. But the wheel is broken. But the flow of essence. I mean, that's the wheel. The flow of essence between the beyond and here. Well, maybe this just goes from Kazuari. The faces of the hunt continue to rule the Crucible and Galloway's, or rather, Tawamawai's name. The trials summoned by the statue grow deadlier with each season. Like the other souls following in your wake, Muatu eventually yearns to move on to the beyond and the wheel. Stymied by Aethys' actions, however, he settles on returning to Kazuari, where he joins the choir of souls that echo throughout the Crucible. Yeah, basically, it's just a close wheel. Hundreds of kith, and no small number of wilder and primordials, flee from the Black Isle. Their minds a confused collection of inconsistent and contradictory memories. Each escapee bears knowledge that was once lost, and agents of the Hand Occult across Aeora worked tirelessly in the years that followed to hunt down and end these fugitives. Encouraged by her arcane successes, Bakarna returns to her observatory to continue her studies of the celestial spheres. In time, her colleagues in the Circle of Archmagi come to accept her among their number. Slain by your hand, the Titan of Wal poses little further threat to Aeora. As the corpse decays, it putrefies into a massive nest of hungry fungal monstrosities. Vessels that anchor off the shores of the Black Isles tend to go missing, only to turn up shipwrecked months or even years later against distant shores. With time, though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed. Adair returns to Hisongo, where he reunites with Burn, the son of his former lover, Alava. 
The boy takes heart and I dare's account that Aethys and all the other gods were false, petty, and unworthy of the love of Kith. Realizing how close he came to dying for this cause, Fern finds renewed purpose in working alongside his uncle to repair the many scars left upon Deadfire by the gods. Under Adair's guidance, Fern grows into the kind of irreverent, stubborn hothead that would have made his mother proud. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind. And Shodi begins teasing, seemingly lit with an inner glow. Shodi takes to a new life of mission work with Gusto. She still is committed to shepherding souls for Gon, but having realigned her goals with that of her fellow Dawnstars, she now endeavors to help the living as much as the dead. As you travel the dead fire, you find her sleeping better and laughing more. When the time comes for her to return to her temple in Nekataka, it's with a clear wistfulness and much lip biting on her part. She leaves you with her sickle and a hastily scrawled note. It reads, A keepsake from a path once walked. Remember me, Watcher, for I will forever dream of you. Though the two of you no longer travel together, Shodi holds fast to the memory of you in her heart, remaining your fierce and doting girlfriend, faithful even in her absence. You receive a missive for every day apart, though they often arrive in a single bundle some weeks or months past. In them, she writes of how she misses you, how you are like a fire that burns inside her, how one day, surely, you will be reunited. Aloth renews his commitment to destroying the Leaden Key, with the wheel broken, loosening the god's stranglehold on Kith is more urgent than ever. It is a lofty goal, and one he does not expect to finish in his lifetime. But if there's one thing he's learned from the Watcher, it's that a single person... You let Romaro go, and the former pirate ostensibly set sail for the trade lanes of the Eastern Reach, the Edier Empire, Old Valia, and the Republics. For the remainder of your time together, Seraphin seems, if not exactly, and yet, when the two of you part, Seraphin seems emboldened, invigorated by a new sense of purpose. He buys you a drink, toasts to the dead fire, says, let's see if we can make something worth a shit out of what's left of these Principe swabs, and sets sail the next morning. In the years to follow, Rumors occasionally reach you of the Blue Orland Pirate of the Dead Fire, a privateer captain as keen to free slate after reporting back to her superiors for the Watcher's actions against the Valian Trading Company. Palagina is rewarded with reassignment home to the Valian Republics. She spends the next several years as the head of the household guard for the Duke of Ancenze. In this role, she is often lauded for her courage and loyalty. Even with all of the praise, there's still times when time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the Deadfire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty than she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics. Though Mayo's covert assignment in the Dead Fire is considered a success, few claim knowledge of it or openly congratulate her. She receives no praise beyond knowing glances or the occasional raised tankard from her countrymen. She never responds. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. Takehu never intended to grasp at the destiny his coming foretold, but he finds himself doing just that. 
He sails from island to island as an emissary from the gods to the Juana people. The tribes welcome his message and use it to bridge their traditions across the archipelago. Juana unity has never been stronger. Your farewell is short and cordial. Nothing further needs to be said, and you wish each other well. Takehu does not look back. The sea your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of Kith and the course of nations. The cycle of reincarnation has been broken. The storms of Andra's mortar have calmed. Yet each ending promises a new beginning. As the sun rises over Ukaizo, Kith turn their gaze east as the watcher of Kadnua and the former herald of Bereth. You return to your ship and begin the long journey home. And there it goes. Zoom, 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 zoom,